6.02, and we have a quorum, so we'll start the meeting. And the first uh, item is changes to the agenda. And we do have a change tonight because the public hearing was warned uh, for 6 o'clock. So we're going to move that item up before Velco. So it'll be the new number five. So um, any other changes to the agenda? And we'll move on to public comment period. This is for the members of the public, if any are with us, to comment on anything not on tonight's agenda. And Charlie, I'll leave it to you if there's anyone from the public to. Um, there are a couple folks I'm not fully, uh, Mark and Lou, are you here for Velco or uh, as for something else? Yeah, we're both with Velco. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> All right, then we'll move on to the consent agenda. And there was a one consent, oops. I move we approve the consent agenda. Second. Okay, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone wish to abstain? Okay. Mr. Yeah. Chair, I just want everybody to know that I'm representing both the town outside the village and the village. Tonight. Okay. Was that Jim and Andy? Yes. 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 Okay. Minutes of April 21st, 2021 meeting. Looking for a motion and a second. Move approval, move. With, move approval with Catherine's adjustment. I'll second. Okay. Any edits, comments, corrections? I, I live, line 35, page uh, three. I have. Um, I'm not sure what it, it feels like there's something missing because it says Dave explained hiring an electrician to install the level two option at home would cost between 300 and 500 dollars comma and DC fast charging stations. It duh, yeah, there's something missing there <laughs> and I looked at my notes to see if I had written anything and I I just had you know a, a thing about level one and level two charging which was this paragraph before. So I don't know what to say, but it just feels like there's something you're, you're dropping the end of the sentence. <laughs> we have the presentation so we can look back on that and um, make the update. Okay. Because otherwise you just, you, you know, just put a period sort of a comma and then life moves on too. <laughs> Any other changes? Hearing none. All those in favor of the motion with that change, say aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 Anyone oppose? Anyone wish to abstain? Okay. Then we're going to move now to the FY22 UPWP and budget public hearing. I'm looking for a motion to open the public hearing. So moved. I'll second, Jim. Okay, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Or raise your hand. Anyone opposed? Anyone abstain? Okay, public hearing is open. Do we have any members of the public out there? No. <clears throat> so, and Charlie, is someone? Go ahead. I ask that we uh, keep the public hearing open until um, we get to the PWP action item after okay. Belco. So. Okay, so we'll keep the, the public hearing open and move now to item, previous item seven, now I guess it's uh, R five, be now six, the Velco Long Range Transmission Plan Presentation. And is it Hans? Did I oh. pronounce that right? Yes, yes. <laughs> um, I'll just give a little intro, Mike. Okay. Um, so... Uh, we had invited Shana and Hans here and um, Mark and Lou, thanks for coming as well, um, to give you a presentation on the draft long range transmission plan. Um, so apologies that you didn't have a memo just sort of introducing this in the packet, but um, essentially 
These folks um, manage the statewide electric transmission system. And every three years, they do a sort of projection out 20 years looking into the future and do a plan about um, any challenges that they see with that and um, any solutions to those challenges. We thought it would make sense for them to come and talk uh, to our board because there are some um, interactions with our energy plan. So um, just wanted to give you guys this background information. Uh, don't need any action or anything from the board, but we will be incorporating some of this into our next energy plan update, which unfortunately is right around the corner. So um, <laughs> I, with that, I will turn it over to Shana first. Does that make sense? Or Hans? Thank you, Regina. Uh, good evening, everyone, and, and thank you for the invitation uh, to come here and, and speak with your board about the long range plan. Uh, we wanted to come and, and share the findings of, of this 2021 public review draft. This has been that 18 month uh, to 24 month collaboration of working with many entities across the state and the region. Uh, to be able to develop uh, appropriate forecasts uh, to put uh, build the plan off of. Uh, and really what we're looking at is a 20-year projection of any deficiencies that Velco as the transmission operator needs to be aware of uh, for our planning purposes and uh, for reliability purposes. Ultimately, uh, we want to keep the lights on and we don't want anything... Uh, uh, interrupting our uh, bulk transmission system. Uh, since the public review draft was published in early April, uh, we've been facilitating uh, lots of conversations with various stakeholders like yourselves uh, and collecting public input from public members, from stakeholder groups, uh, ranging anywhere from regional planning commissions to renewable energy developers to regulators um, really wanting to uh, get uh, any feedback uh, out of this plan that uh, we should be considering uh, before we finalize it uh, at the end of June. And uh, we, we are required by Vermont state law to um, publish a, a final version and submit it to the Vermont Public Utility Commission by July 1st. Uh, so, this is our public comment period. So any questions or input that you might have uh, tonight is uh, greatly appreciated. And any questions afterwards, uh, we're, we're always uh, willing to, to talk further about this. Um, I, oh, and I probably should introduce myself. Um, my name is Shana Loisel. I work for Velco in the communications uh, department, but I also facilitate the Vermont System Planning Committee, uh, which is a statewide stakeholder group that really focuses on those grid reliability issues. And Hans and his planning team uh, also joined me on, on that Vermont System Planning Committee and they're here as well tonight. I'll let them uh, do their intro. And uh, Hans, before you dig into the, the presentation, um, I'd love to just show this group a two minute video that basically summarizes what you're about to hear from Hans. I think it's just a, it's an effective way to kind of grab those main points and then let's dig into the details. So Hans and team, please uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Shana. Uh, Hans Pleasume, I'm uh, manager of system planning at Velco. Uh, been uh, doing interconnection studies, long-term planning studies, all sorts of uh, analysis to look at uh, our ability to, uh, to connect loads, uh, customer demand, as well as generation in the state. And, uh, and my group uh, performs the analysis for a 20 year long range plan. Uh, Shannon noted we do this every three years. And uh, this is, I think, the sixth time we updated the plan. So, so glad, glad to be here to discuss this with you. I'm Lou Ciceri, uh transmission planning engineer at Velco, working for Hans. Uh, been there for about six years now, working on things like the long range plan, other types of analysis, uh, as well as some sustainability efforts. Uh, my name is Mark Allen. I've been with Falco. I just celebrated my one year anniversary th uh, this week. And um, uh, 
yeah, did, did some work on range transmission plan and, and uh, enjoyed my involvement there. Thank you all. And I know we also have a, um, a distribu distribution utility member here as well, uh, Graham Turk. So thank you for being here. If there are any questions specific to Green Mountain Power's distribution utility uh, system, uh, it will be wonderful to have a representative to speak to that system. So uh, without further ado, I am going to share my screen and uh, share with you all a quick two minute video. <clears throat> Can you see my screen? Yep. Yes. Velco manages the statewide electric transmission system, infrastructure critical to Vermont grid reliability as our state imports 100% of its power virtually every hour of every day. Ensuring transmission reliability demands constant attention, careful analysis, and long-range planning. Every three years, Velco produces a 20-year projection, the Vermont Long Range Transmission Plan, that inventories future transmission reliability concerns and proposes solutions to address them. Its core goal is to identify opportunities to use non-wire fixes to emerging transmission grid problems. The 2021 plan reveals Vermont's future transmission system reliability depends on continued energy imports. Reliability will not be compromised. Even then, however, Vermont's in-state transmission and distribution grid must evolve to be able to fulfill Vermont's climate and clean energy-driven requirements. Electricity use is growing to power transportation and heating. This will significantly increase electric demands on Vermont's grid. More solar panels and more storage batteries are being installed. This is great progress, yet we can't be sure when and by how much it will increase. But they will all need to be connected and coordinated. The plan concludes building new transmission is avoidable if projected increases in energy use for vehicles, homes and businesses are effectively managed. That means implementing strategies to better collaboratively synchronize energy demands with supply. These include thoughtful generation siting, storage, flexible load management programs, grid automation and grid reinforcements, all with controls that enable collaborative orchestration. This is the opportunity before us. Great, thank you. I'll stop my share. Uh, again, so that's just a kind of a quick highlight of what uh, Hans is about to dig into. And uh, Hans, if you'd like, I'll I'll pull up the presentation on my computer and I can drive for you. Thank you, Shana. Okay. I think we can go to slide three. Uh, I think we've covered this slide. <clears throat> okay, so our long range plan starts with a, a load forecast. And what you see on the screen is our um, forecast for the next 20 years. Uh, we, we, are, we designed the system to, to be able to serve uh, the maximum electric demand. That's the demand that you see in the, the hot summer day or, or, or very cold winter, it's the maximum level at uh, any hour in the year. Um, and uh, the load that we serve is, is net of solar PV. Uh, it includes the effects of energy efficiency, the demand response, electric vehicle loads, heat pump loads. Um, and because uh, electric vehicle loads and heat pump loads are, are uh, uncertain, uh, uh, we, we developed three different forecasts, uh, low, medium, high. And what you see on the screen is a comparison between our medium and high forecasts, summer and winter. Uh, medium forecasts are in uh, dotted lines, uh, red for summer and, and blue for winter. Uh, and high forecasts are in the solid, solid lines. As you look at the, I guess the first five years of, of the forecast, there's really not much difference between the medium and high, but as you go further in the future, these curves you know, they start to diverge. Uh, you can see a difference in, in 2030, and, and the difference is much, much wider in 2040. And the reason for that is, is, our, is the projections for future heat pump loads and electric vehicle loads. Uh, and just looking at 2040 uh, figures, uh, 
heat pump load for the summer uh, is really about cooling, and it's only about 43 megawatts at the peak hour. Whereas in the winter in 2040, it's 292 megawatts. So it makes a huge difference uh, between summer and winter, uh, particularly at the, at the peak hour. Um, so our projections show that the summer uh, high loads are, can be about 1,400 megawatts, whereas in the winter, it can be as high as 1,800 megawatts. To put this into context, uh, today, our uh, summer peak, our winter peaks are about 1,000 megawatts. So we're projecting uh, just 80% growth in the next 20 years, mostly because of electric vehicle loads, which is quite high um, during the winter, and heat pump loads. Here, next slide, Shana. We also forecast solar PV. Uh, and again, here, there's several scenarios that we, we uh, developed. Uh, one is the economic forecast. Uh, it is called an economic forecast because it's based on a uh, payback model that our consultant, um, ITRON, utilized. It, it uh, assumes that the amount of investment in, in solar PV depends on your um, the cost of solar PV systems and incentives, uh, investment tax credits, et cetera. Uh, so the R line is what that that it represents. Uh, we were predicting that it would be, it would flatten out in the next five years and remain at about 600 uh, megawatts or so. But what's really important in Vermont is that we have a um, an RPS that requires in-state uh, small scale renewable energy, uh, about 10% of energy sales. Uh, and that's represented in the blue curve. Uh, and this is um, predicted to grow from 300 megawatts to about 680 megawatts in 2032. Um, and we've also talked uh, about the uh, possibility of doubling that in Vermont. And that's represented in the gray curve. As we double uh, the tier two uh, requirements to 20%, we can reach about 1,200 megawatts in 2032. That's a, it's a very high amount. Uh, generation in a system that is built to uh, to serve about a thousand megawatt of load, um, and so we we had to test this amount to see whether the system can accommodate a such a large amount of solar PV on the system. All right, so your next slide, Jana. And so the results we go into the results now. We divided the results into two parts. One is our ability to serve our peak demand, and and the other. Side talks about our ability to host or accommodate a large amount of solar PV. So this slide is showing our results for summer peak and winter peak, um, and it's essentially saying that we have sufficient capacity to serve peak demand in the next 10 years. Uh, there are a few locations uh, where there could be concerns. Uh, we address them either by adjusting tie line or uh, operated actions. And in some cases, uh, some loads needed to be disconnected. Um, that's a, that's that is considered acceptable based on standard um, reliability standards, but we have to look in, um, at the risk of losing this amount of load that could be from five to 150 megawatts and decide whether it makes sense to uh, resolve these issues in Vermont. Um, and as we look at the the high load scenario, uh, again, if you look at the the loads in 10 years, uh, it, it, it is higher than today. Um, I guess quite, you know, quite a bit higher, it could be 1300 megawatts. But we find that we can serve that, uh, particularly if the utilities continue to manage their peak loads. They're doing an excellent job at, at managing peak loads through um, storage or other, other means. Uh, but after 10 years, uh, even with what we're doing today, uh, we predict that transmission upgrades would be required. So we are recommending that the utilities ramp up their load control, load management, uh, energy efficiency, and even uh, uh, you know, install future generation to, to be able to serve the load and avoid um, uh, major transmission upgrades in Vermont. Okay, now I'll go into the generation section of our analysis. Um, so we tested very high, uh, very large amounts of solar PV. And the way we did that is we looked at what's been installed uh, in the last few years. So as of 2020, I think we had about 400 megawatts of solar PV in the system. And we took this uh, geographical distribution of solar PV and we increased um, uh, the amount 
going forward using the same distribution. And that is without worrying about avoiding transmission concerns. Uh, and, and when we did that, several of our transmission facilities uh, exceeded their capacity and they're illustrating this map as the orange lines uh, starting from Canadian border, you know, northwest corner of the state down to the Rutland area. Uh, and also see some dotted lines from Rockland to, uh, to Cavendish or Ludlow. And this is to indicate their additional facilities that would exceed their, uh, their capability if we import uh, uh, from New York, uh, which is what we do. Uh, you know, this, we have a tie to Plattsburgh, New York, to St. Barbara, Milton. And uh, we import 100 megawatts, and, and, and then we do that, we, we overload or exceed the capacity of our transmission system. Um, and there's several substations also where transformers are, are overloaded. And you'll also see on this map, there's a vertical line in New Hampshire, it's called New Hampshire Impacts, and it, it is to indicate that as we increase solar PV in the state, um, certain times of the year, particularly in the spring, where we exceed the amount of uh, we can accommodate or absorb in Vermont. Some of that energy will flow to our neighbors. And when that happens, our, the lines, uh, transmission lines in New Hampshire will be negatively affected. Um, uh, that's because we're interconnected uh, and what happens in Vermont affects our, our neighbors. Uh, the other analysis that we did is we tried to distribute solar PV in a way that avoids major uh, transmission upgrades. And we call that uh, an optimized distribution of solar PV or distributed generation. And we'll, we'll show you this, this map on the next slide. And uh, so the transmission, the uh, map is in the middle. Uh, we divided this into 16 different zones. Uh, for planning purposes. And uh, this, this map is showing that we have more capacity, transmission capacity in the southern portion of the state. And that allows us to um, uh, accommodate uh, more generation in these areas. So the southern area, you can install anywhere from 200 to 300 megawatts of generation. And as you move north, there's, there's less and less that it can be installed or accommodated in the system. Uh, so Rutland, you can install between 150 to 200 megawatts. And close to the Canadian border, you can only accommodate about zero to 25 megawatts. And that's where there's an area we call Sheffield Gate Export. Um, you may have heard of uh, where generation today, wind plants or hydro plants are being curtailed because there's not enough transmission capacity to allow all these generation to run all the time in certain conditions that be curtailed. Um, and also added on this slide, um, distribution maps that uh, Billington Electric and JMP have on their website. And uh, and, and, and this is uh, something that um, we, as we propose, as we um, uh, review this plan with, with our, our public, uh, we, the, what, what's been asked is for us to overlay distribution related issues with transmission. Uh, and it is um, for developers to look at the map and determine where it's best to connect or not connect. Uh, for example, a developer could look at the Middlebury zone and see that we can install between 25 and 50 megawatts. But if you look at the GMP map around Middlebury, there are certain lines that are green, which means that there's enough capacity for additional generation. And if you see, you know, uh, yellow or orange uh, feeders, distribution feeders, it means there's less capacity to connect. And the red feeders are where there's absolutely no capacity for future generation. And so developer that looks at the distribution maps and the, generate, and the transmission map can decide where exactly um, the project can be connected. All right, so next slide, please, Shana. Uh, and this table shows um, uh, the, the same information that you saw on the map. It's the optimized um, distribution um, by uh, a regional planning commission. Uh, and, and we compare that with the uh, various targets. Uh, we, we looked up the, the, um, the various plans that are out there um, in 2025, 35, and 50. And compared these numbers to the optimized distribution, which is the third column. Uh, it says optimized solar PV distribution. And 
pretty clear that the uh, the optimized numbers are, in most cases, are less than the targets for each region. Uh, there's a couple areas, um, like Wyndham County, I think it's in Northeastern, where the optimized is, is higher. So there are certainly areas uh, of, of concern here, which means that, that we need to find ways to meet these targets. Uh, you know, this table doesn't say you can't achieve these targets. What it means is um, you have to do other things like install storage, for instance, to consume, uh, to absorb the excess generation in these areas, or perhaps add load. Uh, you can do load management or load flexibility to move loads around, or, or perhaps to curtail generation at certain times of the, of, of the day or certain seasons, for instance. Uh, these are potential things you can do. And and um, and so that I also have the next slide where you can estimate how much storage or, or, or load management you would need by uh, by area. Uh, and this table, uh, this analysis is fairly simple. Uh, at, uh, as we said, we divided the state into 16 different zones, and what we're comparing here is a non-optimized distribution of solar PV, which is the same as today, uh, which doesn't uh, worry about constraints on the system, and compare. The optimized distribution which avoids major transmission upgrades. And the difference is what we call an excess generation, right? So, St. John's, for instance, there's 5.6 megawatt of excess generation. And if you do that, all the zones where you have excessive generation and add all, all these numbers up, you get uh, for statewide about 346.8 megawatts of excess generation in the state. That, if you want to do that, then you'd have to. Uh, or install storage or, or curtail this amount of generation or add this amount of load statewide. Um, if you do it by storage, uh, this would, in fact would be the capacity that you need in terms of megawatt or, or kilowatt. But what's also important is how long you need that capacity for. Uh, if you need it for four hours, then the amount of energy that's required is in the order of 1400 megawatt hours. Um, so in designing a solution, not only concerned about the capacity that you need, for, but also the duration for that for that solution. Okay, go to the next slide, Shana. So our, our recommendations are that we need to, in terms of accommodating future generation or renewable energy targets, we need to pay more attention to location. Uh, if we install generation where there is capacity, then we stand a better chance of avoiding major transmission upgrades. And uh, what you can also do is, is to use uh, flexible loads or load management. Uh, you can, for instance, allow the inverters, uh, solar PV inverters or storage inverters to provide grid support, which is the functionality that they do have. They just need to enable that, allow uh, to provide support. And that actually um, allows us to add even more generation in the state. Um, and what you can also do is, is control um, generation. Um, but to do all of that, whether it's storage or, or managed loads or generation, you need you need communication. You need to connect um, fiber or or um, microwave, or whatever it means possible, to connect the um, resource uh, to the control center so that you could uh, determine what's happening there. Uh, you can disconnect the the resource. You can um, cause it to ramp up or ramp down. Uh, that's that's these are the things that you can do to manage uh, the, re the issues that we're seeing on the system. And of course, uh, even with these um, uh, measures or, or mitigating measures, there is areas of the state where we need to reinforce the grid. That could be on, on the transmission level, or the sub-transmission level, or distribution investments. Um, you know, these investments can be cost effective uh, in, in many cases, uh, and when that happens. Uh, these are the, the kinds of projects that we will uh, recommend uh, to be implemented. Um, I think this is the, the last slide, and uh, I don't know if there's any. Um, we'll, we'll continue to do our outreach, um, and as Jane noted uh, earlier, uh, for any questions come up after this presentation, you can reach out to us uh, through email or by phone, and we'll respond to, to these questions. And so, hey, Sons, I'll yep. hand it back I'll over to questions. 
Yeah. Great. I'll hand it back over to Charlie or Regina. Um, happy to take any any questions on on this call or or later. Looks like we have a hand up. And this presentation is relatively short. We've all, what we did is we included a few slides as appendices. Um, you can you can. Uh, look up these slides uh, for additional information about storage and loads, load forecast. Uh, um, we, we wanted to allow time for discussions and questions if we had any. So, Mike, I don't have anything else to add if you just want to go through folks who have questions. Okay. Okay. Sure. And, I, and I can't see raised hands, so if you or Charlie or someone can recognize them, that'd be great. Sure. So, so far, I see, just so you know, uh, Garrett, Jeff, Bard. All right. Why don't we start with Garrett, since that's the first name you threw out there. <laughs> it's certainly not alphabetical. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak very briefly to what the different storage options are. I mean, I thinking capacitors probably won't cover for four hours, but I don't know. I'm not familiar with, uh, you know, large uh, storage. So what are the options that you have? Sure. The right. So there are various, various technologies available. Um, uh, I mean, these days, uh, what we see mostly battery storage, uh, lithium ion, um, uh, but there, there are other, other storage you can do. Um, this pump hydro, which may or may not be possible in Vermont, um, there are mountains here. And if you have elevation, you could you could use hydro, uh, pump hydro to store a lot of energy. Typically, when we talk about long long range or long term um, storage. Usually, pump hydro is one at Hireman, Breswamp, Northfield. There's several of those resources in New, in New England. There's also other technologies uh, uh, that's flow batteries uh, for for long-term storage. Um, we've also uh, seen recently, uh, it's not necessarily a new technology, but it's it's uh, it's a very exciting way to use old technology. Uh, it's it's um, compressed air. Uh, uh, air is compressed enough to store the energy, and then when you need to deliver it to the system, you heat up the air. And that turns carbon to provide uh, you know the energy back to the system, uh, and there's a lot of different different ways of of, of kinetic energy you can use. Uh, but today it's it's mostly batteries. You can also, can also definitely do that with batteries. Um, you can have four eight hours, but uh, there's there are other technologies out there to do the same thing. Thank you. Sure. Okay, I see Bard has his hand up. Hey, thanks. Yeah, this is really interesting. I have sort of two questions. The first one is, um, and I'll phrase them both. Uh, the first one is when we say attention to siting, I don't know if this is more a question for commission staff or for you to operationally define or explain what attention to siting would mean in terms of a review of a proposed project, um, what that might look like for our planning commission. And the second part is any comments you have about the emerging fairly ambitious targets for transition to electric vehicles. And it strikes me that what you've described here seems somewhat daunting in terms of transmission distribution. Um, if we picture a significant percentage of the state's vehicles moving from gasoline uh, distribution to electric distribution. So sure, a two-part. Sure. Yep. Thank you. Um, right. So in terms of citing, uh, what, we, what we, we've seen in our analysis, there are certain parts of the system where there's already constraints, where generation is being curtailed, right? Um, and uh, certainly the PUC is paying attention to that. They're aware of these areas and uh, large projects. And I mean, uh, you know, a 500 a kilowatt project or, or megawatt project would, would receive enough intention that would have to demonstrate that it doesn't affect the system negatively. Uh, there are other areas of Vermont where there's, there's a lot of activity um, as the 
Addison County, where, where we're starting to see at the distribution level, where, where, uh, where you see the, the red, um, red areas here in the GNP system, these are areas there's so much generation that, that um, these feeders are, are, are at capacity. Uh, we cannot add any additional um, solar TV. Uh, you know, things could be okay at the distribution level, but in aggregate, uh, generation that can cause problems on the uh, transmission system. So what we're saying is um, when a significant amount of generation is connected to distribution, we need to perform an analysis that also can use the capacity of transmission and determine whether there are any issues to be addressed there. Uh, currently, that is not being done. Uh, and in terms of so the, the uh, reliability, the regional uh, planning regions, um, you see that the, uh, a large plant or, or a large number of plants are connecting to, to a certain area, and you know that your, say your targets are are uh, are much higher than the optimized solution. You may think of, for instance, as a potential mitigating measure to encourage developers to also look at uh, co-located storage as part of their project uh, or, or you know, to be able to run and not affect the system. That's a possibility. Um, I think that's, so that was the first question. And the second question about the sort of electric vehicles, heat pumps, other technologies that are being adopted um, and, and is to be a much much more in the future. I mean, that is what we we want in, in Vermont to, to uh, electrify transportation and, and heating. Uh, our forecast is predicting very large amount of loads. And we know that the system is not designed to uh, serve such a high load. Uh, uh, and there again, we're saying it does not mean that we can't do this or, or we should not have electric vehicles in Vermont. What it means is we need to think about the ways to make that happen. Uh, it could be uh, load control. Uh, the utilities are doing that already uh, to provide incentives to customers so that they do not charge at the wrong time. Of, of, uh, when they come home at six o'clock, they don't charge right away. Uh, maybe start charging at 10 or 11 p.m. Um, and, uh, um, customers pull, uh, give utility um, control of the chargers that the utility can decide that this is not a good time to charge and then they disconnect the charger. Uh, but then there's a, there's a, a program or, or control that ensures that the, the battery is charged before you know, five or six o'clock in the morning. So there are various ways to, to address these issues. Um, uh, and we're recommending that employees find uh in innovative ways to uh, scale these these um, these um, these measures, right? And and I, I know we, we can, but we need to think about how to plan and and um, implement these these measures. So would it be safe to summarize that uh, by saying we need to do some things that we have yet to do, uh, or do them better? Uh, uh, essentially, ramp ramp that up significantly. Uh, because it's it's um, what we're hearing. What we're hearing is that the our high high load forecast is not high enough because we expect much much more electric vehicles in Vermont to meet our renewable goals. And if that does happen, um, and the, the amount of load that we'll see on the system will exceed our capacity to serve that load. Uh, and if there's not enough load control, then what we're left with is is our requirement for us to design a system uh, in a, uh, and propose transmission reinforcements to allow it to serve that load. It's, it's, our, it's our charge to, to do that. Okay. Jeff, did you have a question? Yes, I had two, actually. I'm going to do my best imitation of Barb. Um, um, when we talk about long-term things, and I realize you get another bite at the apple at three years down the road and six years down the road and nine years down the road, um, just wondering if there are any the potential disruptive effects on our transmission system associated with number one, 
the current PUC docket with Global Foundries um, and your relationship that you have with Green Mountain Power and how that's going to sugar off and how that's going to play into your load forecast because we're going to have another essentially utility entity being factored into the equation, responding to its own demand issues and all those types of things associated with what it does uh, to be remain competitive in the global economy. And then secondly, this commission spent a lot of time looking at uh, transmission proposals uh, to bring stroke of the pen Canadian hydro to parts in Southern New England. And the way we were looking at them, at least in Vermont, I think was that they were gonna be a source of, uh, of funding to help fund some of our transmission upgrades that you know could be um, uh, come along with the need to transmit pretty significant amounts of uh, Canadian power to Southern New England into, into their system. And I just was wondering, is that all over now? We're not going to be looking at that for the next 20 years because of our regional demographics, or is that something that could pop up in six, nine, or 12 years from now? You might be talking about that again in your 20-year plan. Sure. Um, right. I think I think so. The, I'll answer the Canadian import question first. That I think there's a, still a possibility that uh, a project similar to. Um, what's being done elsewhere in Maine and Massachusetts could connect to Vermont. Um, and, and it could be uh, earlier than the 10, 12 years. I think it's, uh, if anything's going to happen, it's probably going to happen in the next five, five to 10 years. It's, it's going to be sooner. Um, and by connecting to the Southern portion of the state, um, it, it, it avoids significant negative impacts on the system. Uh, it's closer to, uh, to uh, the, the bulk system or the, the, the larger grid, it's like the highway, the New England highway is closer than the New England highway so that we don't uh, need uh, transmission line capacity. Uh, so think, uh, if, if, we, if our studies show that there are issues in Vermont and it needs to be addressed where uh, the lines or transformers are, are affected and the developer of such a project will be responsible to fund uh, these upgrades that's how we would we would uh, resolve that issue. Um, and, and in terms of the global foundries, um, the plans there, I think this has to do more with with supply of generation, uh, and not so much the uh, happens at the plant itself. Meaning the global foundries would have access to cheap power, or whether it's New York or New England or elsewhere. And from the transmission system perspective, there's really no change. Uh, as far as I know, Global Foundries is not planning to increase their uh, production, where it would, would increase the amount of megawatts that we need to serve uh, in the area. Uh, there's no change to the um, transmission lines that connect with Global Foundries to the system. Uh, so far, from our perspective, there's really no no change, at least in the near future. We don't, we're not aware of anything that would cause us to uh, upgrade our transmission network because of the Global Foundry's um, plans. Okay. Anyone else have questions? Uh Looks like Sharon, and I just also want to invite Graham uh, from GMP. If you want to chime in at any point, please, please do. And also, Mike, I, uh, looks like John Zaccone has his hand raised as well. Okay. Yeah, I see John. Uh, um, Sharon has questions? You uh, yeah, there was no mention of wind. I was wondering if that's off the table for long-term planning or at least the cycle of planning. Uh, could you repeat that, please? I think I've heard when is, uh, is this a timing issue? For well, well there was no, no mention of wind generation, commercial wind. So I was wondering if that's off oh. the table in terms of long range planning. Um, no, it's really not off the table. It's just that we haven't uh, seen anything that suggests that in, uh, in Vermont, at least, uh, there's any future for wind um, and there's wind being developed but there it's quite small it's connecting to distribution system it's in the kilowatt size or maybe a, a megawatt or so um, at, at the scale that would affect the transmission system 
Um, we believe that it's going to remain that way. Uh, I think there's probably not a lot of appetite in Vermont to to build, um, you know, 50, 100 megawatt wind plants in Vermont. John? Uh, yeah, I, I want to go back to something I think I heard you said, and if I got it wrong, then I apologize. But um, I, I think a minute ago you mentioned that the upgrades that would be needed in generation as we move down the line would be funded by the developer who needs it. Um, and if that is in fact the case, that's a system that we had used in this state for a long time with transportation infrastructure. And we are desperately trying to get away from that now because what it does is it curtails people's willingness to do things because sort of the last in has to pay for the upgrades that should have been paid by everybody all along. And um, that's sort of how we've come to it with transportation and we're trying to change the system that we had where the last in is not the one who funds everything. And so I took a word of caution to myself when I thought I heard you say that we're looking at um, electric transmission uh, as the same, doing the same thing, which is we'll use up all the capacity, let people in, it'll cost one price. And once we get to the end, oh, you're going to have to pay 10, 12, 100 times more because you have to pay to upgrade the system, which we have found with transportation is exactly the wrong way to do it. So if I got this right um, in terms of my understanding of what you said, and if I do have it right, could you please address how that is actually a good system? Well, uh, yes, I think I think you understood that correctly. Um, and and that, this is why it's important to, to uh, fly this, this map, right? If, and you look at the GMP map on the slide here, it says, Areas that are, that are red, they're red because uh, there's no capacity, right? The capacity is all used up. And, and the next developer is now faced with a, a large upgrade. Uh, and, and you're right, what, when the developer sees uh, our uh, cost associated with, the, with an upgrade, well, the developer goes elsewhere. It goes to where a line is green, where there is capacity. And it's the same thing on the transmission uh, level. Um, a, a, a project that causes a system issue possible to, to fix that issue. Um, and uh, I guess the logic behind that is the you know, beneficiary pace. Um, and, and so the, the, you know, the, the, I suppose you could argue that if, 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 um, if these costs are socialized, Right, everybody pays, then then everybody benefits. But is that is that really the case? Right? If if a developer connects to Vermont on transmission, which is a uh, open to all entities, uh, does it does it matter if it's a Vermont developer or a Canadian developer or a Texas developer? Everyone has access. It's an open access system. So. It's connects to the Vermont system to supply power to Vermont or New Hampshire or Massachusetts um, has the same faced by the same rules, right? If they cause a problem in Vermont, they are required to fix it, regardless of where they're incorporated, regardless of their uh, buyers are. Uh, that is the, the sort of the federal rules that, um, that we play by. Just to jump in there, Hans, this is Graham. Uh, on the right, there actually, some of those areas you can see there, in addition to the color, there's the sort of highlighted or shadow. Uh, those are parts of the grid where there is what we recently implemented as a tariff where uh, new solar customers pay a small fee that, that goes towards upgrading the distribution infrastructure to support more generation. Um, we, we always wanna be supportive of, of small scale rooftop solar because there's a clear resiliency benefit, especially if paired with storage. I think as Hans mentioned though, the idea is you wanna be sending a signal to the larger scale solar development that they should be going in areas that don't have existing lot of generation um, because those are the projects that, that take up a lot of the, the remaining capacity for the rest. Uh, and we wouldn't wanna block out smaller sites that are they're trying to do rooftop because there's, there's a lot of large projects that while provided the renewable benefit, they don't have the resiliency angle. Um, they're not providing critical backup during storms and outages in a way that 
rooftop solar or behind the meter solar when paired with battery storage might be able to provide. Great, great. Thanks, Greg. Okay, other questions? I don't see any. Um, if, if I could then, Mr. Chair, just one sure. more quick question. I read a while ago, and the details are a little lost in my head, about when we all move to electric cars that our vehicles will become storage for um, places like Green Mountain Power, since everybody's now got batteries in their house and in a, in a, a line in, I mean, a line out rather, that that can also become a line in and that we would be collectively used as a storage facility. Is there any real future to that? Or is that something that I just read because it was in someone's brain at one point in time that got a journalist involved? Uh, <laughs> it, 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 is, is that a live thing or is that not? It, it is, it is, it is live. Uh, uh, what we've seen in, in Vermont these days is uh, we, we shut off the charger, right? But there's nothing that uh, preclude somebody to sign up as a, a, a resource where you could actually drain the battery, uh, support the grid, I mean, perhaps under emergency conditions, right? I don't know if there's a if there's a rate today that allows uh, Vermonters to do that, but it's certainly possible the technology is there, uh, it can be enabled and and customers could participate if that, if that were to, to be the, you know, the uh, new program, for instance, um, but it's always about about customer choice, right? And if um, perhaps if you're on a weekend, a Saturday to Sunday, you could put your car battery out there to be utilized by the, by the utility. But if you have a, a trip tomorrow, uh, you're going to Boston or something like that. Maybe not. You won't. You won't allow your car to be to be drained, right? Uh, before you go to work or to take a trip tomorrow. So. Yeah, I think the other the other adjective uh, would be voluntary. <laughs> I've, I've been with programs, uh, and certainly Graham can speak more to that. Yeah, John, if you'd like, uh, we we have one of these. If they're called vehicle to grid or bi directional chargers at our office, and are are using it with one of our fleet vehicles now as sort of a proof of concept. So it's definitely real. Uh, and as Shana mentioned, it's it's something that we would we would never do without a customer's consent. But often the schedule of driving and when cars are plugged in aligns actually quite nicely with when we would want to be dispatching those systems to reduce our system peaks. Those typically occur in the evening uh, when the car is plugged in at home. And so it's we're still waiting a little bit on technology to mature. And right now there's not a residential model that allows you to do it, but I expect we'll see one soon. And it is a really exciting merging of electric vehicles with benefits of battery storage, um, plus resilience. You could you could essentially plug your car into your house and have that be your backup generator during an outage. And we're looking at doing that with schools as well for electric buses. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I don't know if there's any last things that you wanna leave us with or Regina, if you have anything or Charlie. The only thing that we, we want to leave you with is if there are any follow-up questions or comments that you'd like to talk more about, uh, we're available. And yeah, thank you again for giving us the time to come and talk about this you know, very important topic. And uh, in terms of the plan itself, you gave the presentation. Is the presentation or the plan, is there a, a link that you can share with us? Yes, absolutely. I'll send, uh, well, I, I already did send Regina the, the presentation and the public review draft is available on Belco's website. So I will send a link uh, to share. Great. Thank you very much. We appreciate oh, thank it. You. Thank you for having us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Ah, and we're back. Okay. So, we still have the public hearing open. Um, Charlie, I don't know if, is there some kind of presentation that, that you or Forrest or someone wants to give to uh, us? No, uh, you, you got the uh, UPWP and budget in your packet. Um, 
And I think uh, kind of given the length of time that we just spent on Velco, uh, you know, happy to dive in deeper if you'd like to the work program. But uh, at this point, we're not planning to do a presentation. Okay. So, so are there any folks from the public uh, with us that would like to comment? I move we close the public hearing. I'll second. Okay. So I take it there's no public out there, Charlie. Okay. Not, not that I can tell. No. All in favor of closing public hearing, raise your hand or say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone abstain? Okay, public hearing is closed. Anyone on the board have any questions about the UPWP or the budget? Um, if I could offer, um, sorry, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, okay. we do have one edit um, that uh, uh, someone would consider in a motion, which is um, there's one task that we just heard from VTrans that they would like to increase the, uh, the amount of consultant dollars in. It's uh, task 7.13 for uh, Vermont culverts or VT culverts. Um, and I think we had $3,000 in the UPWP for consultant dollars. Uh, they would like to increase it to $25,000. It has no impact on our budget because uh, it's state planning dollars um, and they're matching it with other state dollars. So um, it has no impact, but just would um, kind of put that amount in our budget so that we can contract with the consultant in a way that works uh, for us in VTrans. Uh, so that's that's one little note. And um, and I'm, I'm happy, I guess the other thing I'll say about the work program in front of you and the budget, you'll notice there's still um, quite a few cells uh, that are highlighted yellow. Um, and there's still things that you know, are not pinned down. Some of them are uh, legislatively uh, driven. Or, uh, or otherwise, you know, contracts with other agencies um, that we're not sure of the exact amounts uh, as a typical thing, or sometimes it's the exact scope. Um, so I just, I just kind of want to note that. And you know, obviously, as we get those things pinned down over the coming weeks and months, um, we'll uh, update those in the mid-year adjustment. Um, and so um, I get those are really the two uh, comments I kind of wanted to offer and happy to review the budget, uh, review the work program if you'd like. So for the purposes of discussion, Mr. Chair, I'd move we approve the UPWP with the amendment as described by Charlie for the more consultant dollars for that particular work uh, item. Garrett seconds. Okay. okay. Any discussion, any comments, questions? I'm seeing or hearing, I'm sorry. So nobody wants me to go line by line through the budget. Or the no. <laughs> no, it's seven o'clock, people are ready. <laughs> okay, so hearing no questions or comments, I would ask all those in favor of the motion, please say or signify with a raised hand, aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone wish to abstain? Okay, motion passes, thank you very much. Next, we'll move on to VPSP2, Equity Screen for Regionally Driven Transportation Projects. That's a heck of a title. Alani? Yes. So, hello, everyone. Um, so, you do have a memo in your packet describing our first attempt to actually do uh, an equity screening for our VPSP2 Regionally Driven Projects. We actually uh, presented those projects last month to you. Uh, we provided, uh, you know, scores that Christine did, and Christine can give us a lot more detail on those scores, if you would like, uh, using, uh, you know, like a, a methodology, uh, you know, Christine, you want to talk about the methodology between the, uh, uh, you know, the, the scoring differences between your scores and veteran scores? Um I'll just tell you to not really look too carefully at the scores. We're really here to talk about the equity, um, really just to kind of confuse everybody. There's a qualification sheet and a workbook that are different things that are similar and yet not the same. So um, the actual scores we're going to look at next month and they're similar, but they're not exactly the same. 
Um, we did a qualification sheet that was really a screening of our projects, but the, the actual VPSP2 has to be scored with a workbook that was developed by VTrans. So. Thank you, Christine. You explained it much better than I could. So, so basically, this memo is just informational only for you. Uh, this is, again, the first attempt, and it's a, a definitely it's, a, it's an attempt that is going to be improved uh, you know, over the next few, uh, following months and years. Uh, we felt very strongly. So right now, the VPSP2 process does not have an equity category or an equity screening in any way. We felt at the CCRPC very strongly that we had to apply something, so we started the process. We described the methodology in the memo. I'm very happy to go over the methodology with you if you would like or answer any questions. We use the methodology that has been used at an MPO in New Jersey that we felt we have enough we, uh, we felt that we didn't have enough data to do a lot more, uh, you know, quantitative analysis at this point. So we stay higher in a qualitative analysis, but at some point we might want to go down to a quantitative analysis. Um, we also going to be working with the trends and the other RPCs uh, in the next, uh, you know, six to eight months to actually create the methodology and equity screening that is going to be incorporated into the VPSP2 methodology. Um, and I will, uh, what else did we do? Oh, so we, we also reached out to um, some equity partners in the community. So we reached out to Mark Hughes um, and also to the Transportation Equity Coalition to uh, help us with this, uh, you know, to deal with, you know, to, to, you know, review our methodology, but also improve our methodology and provide us some questions that we might be missing right now that we want to include it. So we are getting feedback from them by the end of this week. So we're going to be able to actually apply that uh, before we send the packet to the TAC and the executive committee next week. So, and then finally it's going to come to you in your June meeting. Uh, and at that meeting, you're going to have a lot more detail on the VTRAN scoring as well as how we're going to apply and how we're going to go from a, you know, a qualitative, uh, you know, like scoring and screening for the equity to more a quantitative screening. So you're going to see all that information next, um, next month. Um, so I will stop there and ask for any questions. I am sorry if I confused anybody, uh, but happy to clarify if I can. Eric? Yes. Eric. Yeah. Um, it may be that I should uh, wait on this, but I'll ask it and totally understand if you say wait till next month. Um, okay. I noticed looking uh, through the document um, on the second page of the uh, right below the one with the border about this. You have the higher positive ranking, medium positive ranking, and lower right. ranking. Yes. And I felt like there could be a disconnect there. Um, higher positive ranking has addressed safety problems, but lower ranking is repair roadways or bridges. And in light of uh, the Crown Point Bridge of a few years ago, or the very recent Memphis uh, bridge across the uh, Mississippi, um, repairs would have prevented the safety problems and resulted in absolutely humongous cost savings. And so I, anyway, I guess what it boils down to is I felt there was a disconnect between those two. Yeah, and, and Garrett, I'm just gonna try to answer it, but maybe Christine can answer it better. It's like, you know, safety and maintenance are, you know, an asset. Uh, you know, management is included in the VPSP2 methodology. Safety and, and asset, uh, you know, like uh, management, actually they have the highest scores. 
So we're not ignoring safety. We're not ignoring, uh, you know, like asset uh, maintenance. But I think that uh, this screening is looking at um, if a project actually provides benefits to an underrepresented population and area, uh, and what are those benefits? Does it, it does it have impacts? And what are those impacts to those uh, underrepresented populations? And there is, you know, like a, a number of categories that we have under the underrepresented populations. So this screening is going to be on top of every other category that it's in the VPSP2 uh, process. So we're, we are not ignoring that, but I'm going to stop there. Christine, do you have anything to add? No, I think that's, uh, I think you covered it. Okay. I saw um, Jim, oh, I'm sorry, Gary, you have follow-up? No, okay. Jim, I saw your hand go up and John, I see you've got your hand up. So we'll go Jim and then John. Okay, um, basically the exact same area, but a different question. Um, the high positive rankings seem to look at addressing safety issues and impacts and various results of the project. And at least the way I was reading it, the medium and the lower actually almost talk about actions of what you're doing. And it, I didn't see the relationship between how the high and the medium and the low related to each other because they look like they're measuring different things. So um, okay. I, I'm going to try to address that. Uh, it, it is, uh, again, a qualitative methodology, right? So, so there is a lot of judgment in here. But when we say address safety problems, it's basically very, you know, so very specific improvements to, let's say, high crash locations. If that high crash location is uh, in a in an area that there is, uh, you know, a population, uh, you know, a high percent of population are underserved, then that should get a high score. Um, I I see what you're saying because of the wording, but we felt like everything has actions in it when we were looking at our uh, when we actually uh, assign high, medium, or low. Does that kind of address your question? Uh, so so in essence, the, the high is primarily address safety problems, period, and then add, improve vehicle, et cetera, and then repair roadway bridges. And those are sort of the three main things you're looking at, sort of. And then after that, everything else up in the higher is kind of helping you evaluate, but it's not, not really the, the issue. It's, it's, that seems like that's what you're saying. Uh, well, it is kind of what I'm saying, but okay, not quite. <laughs> so, <laughs> Let's not go any further. That's fine. <laughs> okay, I, I'm happy to discuss offline <laughs> and okay. also answer any specific questions on any any projects that you have. But um, this methodology will probably change. So this is the one that we actually mm -hmm. use right now because we didn't have a lot of time. Uh, we were like crunch for time, but also we didn't have, we don't have a lot of data. So we need to identify data so we can just, um, that we need to improve this methodology. This is the beginning. That's what I want you to just, you know, the, the message right. you want to take. Uh, so I'm John, sorry. John? John, I think. In, 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 in the same vein here, uh, my concern lies in having the equity uh, piece be its own separate ranking that when you look at a piece of paper like this, the general person would look at it and would weight it equal with the overall score. So what you're doing is by doing that, instead of baking it into the overall score by giving it some numeric, numerical value of its own that would you know either boost a project up or bring it down a little bit, you're creating an enormous PR problem potentially where you know good uh, enterprising journalists like I was at one point in time are gonna scrutinize you on just that ranking and believe it's equally weighted to the other. And you're gonna have huge headlines every time you go and build a project with a low score as opposed to a high score. I, I think we have to be careful. I'm, I'm not in any way knocking um, having an equity matrix and, and looking at that, I'm, I'm fine with that. But to present it in a capacity like you're presenting it here, 
uh, you're setting us up for some really unintended consequences that are nothing but negative into the future. And I think we need to be really, really careful about that. Um, okay, I think that that's a, that's a good comment. I think that at the, at the very end of these discussions we're going to have with VTrans and the RPC, we're hopeful that equity will become part of the VPSP2 process as a category, like its own category. So it's inside that 100 points. Right now, we don't have that. Right. So right now, the VPSP2 doesn't have an equity category. So what we are proposing, and it doesn't really matter if we add like points to the high, let's say that we decide collectively to say 20 points to all the high projects or to the to the projects that they have the high equity screening score. Um, and if it goes above 100 for us, it doesn't matter because uh, the veterans uh, doesn't want, I mean, we're not going to give this scoring to veterans. We're going to give them, uh, you know, like a number of projects in the ranking. So uh, I might not be saying that right, Christine. So you might want to just correct me here. But I think that uh, at this point, we are trying to figure out how are we going to apply an equity screening, you know, while there isn't any in this process. And I think it's a little clunky, but yeah, we are going to be- I understand the conundrum and, and, and I appreciate the conundrum, okay. um, but I'm just, just threw that out on the table as something to okay. keep in mind well, when good. you're looking at it. Because we're trying to do a good thing here and we need to have it presented that it's a good thing, not yeah. wind up coming back to bite us in the wrong direction that way. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah. you know, you use Garrett's example as, you know, you don't want a safety project fighting a project that is low or high, depending on how it's viewed in an equity capacity, because I'm not going to judge one more important than another, but in nor, in nor should we have to. Um, that they should all balance and find a way to move and rank our projects and not have one element fight with another. And we just need to be careful how it's presented. That's all. So okay. good, good luck with uh, trying to figure that out. I don't have any great advice for you other than just, <laughs> and, what, and what I'm saying is not trying to be critical of what you're doing here. Just bringing up what I think is a little bit of a red flag that we need to focus on. Thanks. No, that's good. Thank, thank you, John. Thanks. Let's not, let's not tie ourselves up in knots on this. It's a small part of the overall ranking. It's going to have at least two more iterations before we even see it again, folks. So, uh, I mean, give the staff the opportunity to work through the glitches and things like that. And this is, a, this is what we have the tech for, okay? That's right. So um, we, we do this. I've been on the Roundness Commission long enough to remember that we do this to ourselves all the time, and it means very little. So, Charlie, it looks like you wanted to add something, and Bart has his hand up and is eagerly waiting. So, Charlie? Yeah. And I, I'm sorry, Bart. Uh, I see you. <laughs> um, I just wanted to add a little bit uh, larger, put this in context of the larger conversation going on uh, with VTrans and the legislature. Um, I think maybe I mentioned this last month, but... Um, in the, T, the transportation bill this year, the legislature is asking uh, VTrans and the RPCs to come back to them with a report and recommendations about how to address equity. And so what you're seeing is, I don't know, I don't even know if we can, we're just starting to plant the seeds. We haven't figured out you know, uh, exactly what it will grow into, but, um, and, and John, your point is excellent, and Jeff, yours is also, this is not fully baked. Uh, we're just starting to put some ingredients together on the table um, and, you know, welcome any uh, input you have into uh, helping shape what it looks like and, and what recommendations we come up with VTrans uh, at the end of the year. Um, so this is just truly the beginning of a conversation about uh, how best to address uh, equity issues in our prioritization system. So sorry, Bart. Go ahead, Bart. No worries. Um, I was just going to observe, I've seen a similar um, pattern emerge in parts of state government where people are getting started and a couple of ways of thinking about that one is sort of a storming phase in the beginning as you're figuring it out and the other I'm, I'm remembering a phrase that carpenters sometimes use and the question is do you want it done right or do you want it done right now and the answer to that question for this is yes <laughs> <laughs> Right. 
anyone else have any comments or questions? Okay. Thank well, thank, thank you. you very much, Alani and Christine and Charlie. We'll be hearing more of this in the coming weeks. All right, next on the agenda is the executive director report. Charlie. <laughs> Mike, uh, uh, okay. Uh, Mike, your report was very short this month. Um, <laughs> for the uh, director, and Mike could have done this first one, uh, the equity leadership team. Uh, we had our second meeting. Mike, was that this week or last week? I can't remember now. It was uh, the, the Monday, right? It was yeah, this week. Yeah, it might have been yesterday. Or it was <laughs> yesterday. It was yesterday. Yes, it was yesterday. It was, it was a long day. Um, but uh, just to let you know, um, I think out of that conversation um, came the notion that you probably will see some information coming from that group as we're working with the consultant. Um, so there are some readings, and uh, I think um, this this week or this meeting, we uh, watched uh, like a, maybe a 20-minute TED Talk. Um, you know, we kind of have a little bit of homework be before these equity leadership team meetings. Uh, so we'll be sharing uh, that that homework with you uh, just so you can kind of follow along a little bit with what the uh, equity group is working on. Uh, obviously, you won't be part of the conversation all the time, um, but at least you can follow along with the readings and uh, we'll start uh, adding some notes, um, you know, some uh, minutes or a summary uh, as we do with minutes for other advisory committees, we'll start try to start adding the equity uh, team minutes to the uh, to your packet so you can follow along with what's happening. Um, and um, so that's I think that's really the update. Anything you wanted to add there, Mike? No, but I, I think again, um, it, we'll share those that homework stuff so you can see what's going on and and any comments or questions you have, you're more than welcome to to ask anytime via email or, or phone call or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we're really just getting going on this. So um, it's a, it's a pro we had the conversation about, about it's a process. It's going to take a while. It's not going to be done in a week or two. It's going to be a lot more than that. So, and, and I think the other important takeaway I got from last time is we're not really trying to solve the universal picture. We're trying to, to make inroads to, to get on a path to bring us to uh, a final goal. Did you buy that, Charlie? Is that? Yeah, and I think, you know, actually our, our uh, immediate uh, previous conversation, you know, is kind of a little indication, you know, we'll try to work at things that we can work at to make progress on this broader issue. Um, you know, and making transportation uh, project investments um, that, you know, improve equity, you know, is going to be part of it. And I think the previous conversation just made me think what we want to make sure we avoid is something that um, increases inequity uh, or does something harmful uh, to, a, you know, a low income or, uh, you know, predominantly BIPOC community. Um, so I think you know, screening for those things is going to be a, a little important piece of what we can do uh, to help in this overall picture. So, and, and um, one one more thing, just want to remind folks one of the one of the goals we have is coming up with, or, or is coordinating with municipalities and sharing what we what we come up with, and trying to coordinate that we're kind of all going on the same path as opposed to, you know, different paths and and getting nowhere. Yeah, uh, thanks for bringing that up, Mike. Yeah, so um, as part of the scope, uh, RPC staff will have some conversations with uh, each of your towns and we'll try to make sure you're looped into that. And also um, just a heads up, at some point you're gonna uh, probably you know, be asked to uh, provide some feedback either through an interview or uh, maybe participate in a focus group or uh, complete a survey. So um, that's probably, I think, were we talking about like the July timeframe? Mike, I, th I think that's right. Yeah, um, summertime, some, yeah. Yeah, summertime, so just heads up on that. Um, 89 update, uh, the advisory project advisory committee met today. Um, remember the last time we were looking at this and you know, we were kind of trying to conclude the interchange conversation. Um, 
And uh, today we uh, did get a recommendation out of the advisory committee for five scenarios or bundles to move forward in the next round of analysis. One's a, a no build, a, a pure no build. Um, the second bundle is a, a bundle of TDM investments. Uh, you know, what could we do to uh, decrease the demand for driving in our region? Um, and this will be regional, not just focus on the 89 corridor. Um, the third bundle is a package of those TDM investments, and those TDM investments stay in all the subsequent bundles. Uh, so I won't repeat myself every time, but uh, the TDM bundle plus exit 14 improvement. The fourth bundle is the TDM, exit 14, and exit 13 investment. And the fifth one, TDM, exit 14, and 12B. Um, and there's no commitment to any of those, uh, but just that those are the five scenarios or bundles that um, the advisory committee voted out. Um, I will note that there was unanimous support for the first four of those. And there was, uh, the committee was very split. It was actually a six to five vote about keeping the 12B option um, in uh, the analysis. So that's just to inform you, let you know um, where that process is um, and um, yeah I think uh, and I think we're um, kind of on the cusp of it will be some interesting work looking at the TDM and policy options uh, and we're looking at you know some new techniques to analyze those kinds of options and see what kind of impacts they could have so um, and I think it's it's all going to be productive not just for the study but I think it's also going to be very informative for the MTP update that we'll be embarking on next year. Charlie, how, how you said the the focus group um, voted six five not to go with the exit twelve B scenario. No, no, no. I'm sorry, oh. the reverse. I, it was a close vote, six to five, to keep that in. Okay, okay. Because I was just wondering with what's going on in South Burlington with the city council, and I saw an article in the newspaper about you know they're going to revote or. Who knows what's going on, but yeah, how's that all tie in? <laughs> or does it? Directly. <laughs> um, and I, Chris, feel free to weigh in. Uh, but you know, South Rowan City Council uh, voted in a couple uh, a couple weeks ago, three to two, to support uh, moving ahead with 12B. Uh, of course, the other two wanted to move ahead with 13. Uh, and in part, we got an answer like that because we were trying to reduce the number of interchanges to evaluate going forward. Um, and there, were, there was a pretty significant split in the community and, and on city council. Um, we've kind of taken some of the um, anxiety and pressure off of that situation by recommending that we keep both options on the table for this next iteration. Um, and we actually had a joint meeting or, or uh, participated in a joint meeting of South Burlington City Council and South Burlington School District last night, uh, the school board um, because um, the school board hasn't engaged too much. And, you know, I think they raised a number of uh, issues that they want to make sure get addressed uh, around the possibility of exit 13, which of course is, you know, right next to the high school and middle school. Um, so anyway, that's a long way of saying uh, still in process. Uh, we're trying to relieve a little bit of that pressure in South, in the city of South Burlington, because uh, uh, it was getting uh, contentious and fractious for sure. So, um, I think I think we've got a little bit of a path forward now, and you know, we'll we'll come back to it over the fall and the winter. Yeah, I can't offer any more clarity. I think you got the latest and greatest by the steering committee between the school board and the city council last night, and you saying that the uh, school board was uh, asking questions about what the impacts would be. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Um, any other questions on eighty nine? Um, well, actually, and I guess in, in fairness uh, to you, because um, I think you, you may have heard uh, or read concerns uh, that we're getting uh, from a couple of community members about the budget for this. Um, and you'll see in the UPWP, significant investment continuing in the next fiscal year. Um, and I can't commit to you that um, the process and comments that we get, you know, don't require some more analysis uh, to try to um, I think Bard termed it well, uh, do it right or, or do it right now, 
who are trying to, in this case, uh, trying to do it right. Um, and that may take a little bit more effort. Um, so um, we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Um, and then uh, quick update, the clean water service provider, I was hoping the rule would be finalized by now. It's not quite done uh, or published. That should be happening in the next week or two. Um, and similarly, we're supposed to be getting a contract from DEC for some startup funding for that work to start beginning uh, in earnest. I, again, I think sometime in the next couple of weeks um, that is happening. And then uh, last but not least, uh, legislative update. Um, I'm not sure where to start. This is a tough week to do an update. Um, um, so you know, certainly with regards to money issues, you know, that's, uh, they're, they're figuring that out. Um, and the, uh, the federal rules and guidance for how to spend the ARPA money just came out last week. And I think through a little bit of a monkey wrench and some of the ideas, uh, either the administration or the legislature had about how they could spend the money. Uh, so they're having to shift things around and move things that they thought they could do with ARPA into the general fund and maybe some vice versa. Um, so um, I, I won't pretend to give you a real update other than to say the, uh, the sausage is, is getting uh, mixed up and made. Um, and it sounds like they are trying to get done by Friday. Um, you know, Act 250, just because that's always fun to talk about, is definitely, you know, on the burner for next year, uh, not getting done this year. Um, it does seem like um, S101, which is a housing and bylaw modernization bill, is, is moving through, uh, probably with some money attached to it for, um, for municipalities to be able to access funding either through uh, municipal planning grants or maybe even directly from the RPCs to assist with bylaw updates. Um, the rental registry bill, um, sounds like there's, that's under some debate uh, right now. Um, I, I think maybe literally <laughs> right now. Uh, so it's not clear to me exactly uh, if and how that's moving forward. Um, and I don't know if there's other things that people are interested in. Um, happy to try and do it. Sharon may be following some of this clo more closely than I am. But um, Sharon, anything else you wanted to add or were you thinking about? Uh, just the one that we were invested in was the TIF project bill, which pretty much got gutted. So that's yeah. not going to go anywhere this year. Yeah. I think there may be a little bit of the TIF bill that remains uh, mm -hmm. to give a, a little bit of clarity to the existing TIF municipalities. Right. Um, but, but yeah, that, that project-based TIF not happening. Um, any other questions legislatively? Um, I do think um, broadly, I will say, uh, I really felt there was a lot of support in the legislature for the work of RPCs. Um, I think we got brought up in multiple venues um, about uh, one, assisting municipalities with ARPA funding. Um, and uh, so we're partnering with, with VLCT on ARPA funding guidance. Um, VLCT just had a webinar, or, you know, they were the primary host yesterday, um, and which we uh, partnered with them a little bit on. Um, so that's one thing. Um, there also, it does look like, I think I've mentioned before that uh, each RPC will be getting $75,000 in this budget. Um, really just as a, it's a one-time amount, but to recognize that they haven't increased the amount going to RPCs in a long time. Um, and just to recognize that they've also been asking us to do a lot of work. Um, and that I think we'll be able to spend that over one, two or three years. Um, and there is some talk about um, some money being added to the budget for um, Brownfields money, a um, million dollars statewide. Um, so that might uh, turn into about $100,000 for Brownfields assessment, uh, the Chinden County RPC, which would be welcome because we're just about out of Brownfields money uh, from EPA. And then uh, another idea that's come up recently was uh, RPCs helping uh, town energy committees with a, a regional energy coordinator on staff. Uh, so that's getting some discussion. I'm really not sure where that's ending up in the budget. Um, and I think that's pretty much it for things that I'm aware of. 
Okay. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, thank you. Next, uh, we've got committee liaison activities and reports. There are links uh, in the packet. Does anyone have any questions? Anyone on those committees want to add anything? Okay, hearing nothing, we'll go to future agenda topics. Uh, yeah, uh, just uh, real quick, uh, on the second page of the packet or the agenda, you'll see um, you know, June is our normal annual meeting. Um, so uh, obviously election of officers uh, is what that really means. And uh, we normally warn the public hearing uh, for the tip for the July meeting. Um, and um, we do have an opportunity if you wanted to uh, offer any comments on the Velco plan. Um, welcome any feedback now about should we try to prepare comments on that Velco plan? Um, we thought it was just kind of informational. We were not figuring on um, or planning to prepare comments unless you, you ask us tonight. Um, and then the uh, final topic is the, the VPSP2 you know, transportation project priorities uh, to VTRANS. Um, so I guess open question, anything that you think we should be thinking about submitting to Velka uh, with regard to what you heard tonight? Yeah, Jim? I'm just, uh, I'm assuming based on what we heard tonight uh, from staff was that there's no issues on what they are proposing in their plan as it compares to our energy plan and the ECOS plan, but it'd be good to have that verified. That is not, a, no, that's not true. <laughs> okay, well then, then that's something we should know. Yeah, um, and I think uh, Hans and uh, Regina, I think maybe Taylor's unplugged, um, or Melanie may want to pipe up here too, but um, there's definitely an issue in terms of the amount, they had optimized solar, PV solar for our region versus what we were hoping for. Yeah, I, I wasn't asking. I wasn't asking for that comment now. Oh, I was just asking. That's a, a future topic if there's if there's time. Okay. Yeah, there is an issue, Jim. We're not sure that a comment is going to do anything to address it. I guess. Okay. Well, at least at least the staff. I mean, we, I'd like to know what those are at some point. Okay. They're in a memo or something so that we understand. Okay. Sorry, Bart. You know, that was sort of the point of my question. If we're supposed to be doing something at the planning commission in terms of reviewing projects that we're not doing, and I, I let it go, but I didn't think I got a very thorough answer. I think I got a conceptual answer and I already understood the conceptual answer. I was looking for the very practical boots on the ground answer, like what does the regional planning commission have to do differently about siting or site review? And the other comment I'd make, um, not to channel John, but if I remember correctly, when we were talking about the electric vehicle plans, John made the observation within the last two months, well, what about transmission and distribution of electrical power? How's that gonna work? So I feel like we presented with these two plans that do not appear to have been effectively coordinated at this point in time. <laughs> Point taken. Points taken. Okay. Anything I'm still else? Here if, if you guys want me to, to chime in, or we can wait until staff comes up with um, a memo or comments. Yeah, we'll like... follow up with a memo, Melanie. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Anything else? All right. Then, uh, members' item other business. One tiny thing. Uh, I'm just wondering when um, terms for the commissioners, when do they end and when do the new ones start? Do they start at the meeting or during the June meeting or after the June meeting or what? <laughs> yeah. Um, so your appointments are for two years, uh, July through June. Okay. Um, half the towns uh, got uh, a letter from Emma. Uh, probably a month or two ago, right. and I can't, it must be the, the early part of the alphabet, which would include Charlotte. Yeah. It was just August. the July, June question. That was, that was it. Yep. Okay. July, June. 
Any other business? I'm relieved to offer a motion to adjourn. Okay. Second by Garrett. I see him waving his hand over there. <laughs> yeah. Jeff, congratulations again on that ace. <laughs> I'm gonna and, I'm gonna go up and try to do another one right after I get up the Zoom. Okay, we'll <laughs> we'll go quick then. We'll see everyone on June 16th is the next <clears throat> board meeting, executive meeting on June 2nd. All in favor of the motion to adjourn. Aye. 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 Opposed. Aye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night, Take all. Care. Enjoy Thanks, everyone.